Well, it's, uh, it's as we're following on our series on marriage. And um, again, if, uh, if, if you're single today, um, it would be worthwhile you taking notes. Um, but particularly if you're um, thinking about getting married, then you certainly need to, uh, to be aware of things and to take notes. Um, because um, it is so important for us to understand some of the principles of marriage and of relationships generally and how it makes a massive impact. Um, a book I would recommend for those of you that are interested in looking for a partner think you might one day get married, um, a book that I would recommend, there's two books I would recommend actually, maybe three books, um, anyway it's quite a few, but anyway one of them is, um, is called Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Got Married by Gary Chapman. Uh, Gary Chapman, um, again I would recommend his books, he has uh, a series of books called On the Five Love Languages, which again, um, I've not talked about, but is, um, is very eye-opening, and those books would be very um, important for you to help you um, in expressing your love and understanding your spouse's love language. We all have a predominant love language. But a book that actually, I think, probably saved my marriage <laughs> um, in the early years, it certainly saved us having a lot of arguments when we were driving the car, um, was a book called Opposites Attract, and then Attract was crossed out and it said Attach. Um, it's by a guy called Jack Nahal and his uh, wife wrote it, and... Um, it's not particularly, it's not a Christian book that I'm aware of. It's a long time since I've read it, and I don't know if it's still available in all fairness, but um, it, I certainly found it very eye-opening to see the way that I, I could see how Kath thought and Kath could see how I think. So, it, you know, it, if it was even just down to buying something, how you would approach it differently. Um, so it was a, a good book. If it's still out there, um, it's definitely well worth uh, having a, a read. Maybe you could relate to this letter. Dear Pastor, when I first fell in love with my husband, I was sure, absolutely sure, that he was the right person for me. But over the years, as we've lived together through a lot of messy situations, I've seen many sides of my husband that I don't like. My feelings towards him have turned from respect and attraction to disappointment and sometimes even disgust. I now feel like maybe I married the wrong person. Why do I feel this way and what can I do about it? Something has to change. Maybe you feel like that, or maybe you have felt like that. And if you're not married, maybe you will feel <laughs> like that. <laughs> Just thought I'd encourage you guys there, you know. But we've all seen fairy tale weddings end up as horror stories. It's sad, but we see it happen all the time. What starts off brilliant ends up as a disaster. There are often three stages in marriage. The first stage is harmony. The second stage is hostility. And the third stage, often and unfortunately, is apathy. In other words, we start off in harmony and looking at each other and loving one another and just seeing everything, um, as it were, through rose-tinted glasses and then we see each other's faults and we recognize that they're not as perfect as we once thought they were. And th those things start to rub us up and frustrate us and we start to get uh, hostile to one another. 
And then uh, we see things not changing, and then eventually we just become quite apathetic to one another. It's very sad when these things happen, that people just don't, we don't care any longer. So why is it that Mr. Right becomes Mr. Wrong? Why is it that we end up starting with something that is so wonderful and so often ending with something that is a catastrophe? Well, today I want to look at some of the reasons why things end up as they do and some of the keys to making your marriage transform. Because God wants to see your marriage transform. That's his goal for every marriage, is to see a massive change in it, that it becomes what he designed it to us. Now, we all know what a transformation is, haven't we? Yes, when you want to, well, let's say a lady goes to the beauticians and she goes for a makeover, she goes for something, they transform her. Yes, now they don't change her, but they do transform. In other words, they make some tweaks, they know what kind of makeup and what colors will suit and how to do the hair and whatever it is, and the clothes kind of change, so there's a transformation. And I believe God wants to do that with our marriages, that we would have good marriages that are so good for others to be able to see and to learn from. And so, <coughs> I want us to look at, first of all, very briefly, um, why do marriages go wrong? Why do marriages go wrong? What is the cause of chaos and catastrophe in our marriages? And the first thing that's going to sink your marriage is unrealistic expectations unrealistic expectations yes the problem is is we see so much television portrayed in movies of how wonderful it's going to be because they 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 show a fantastic wedding and everything looks splendid and everybody lives happily ever after unfortunately in real life we bring in unrealistic expectations we expect him to be such and such a thing. We have such high expectations of what she is going to be like. Um, you know, we, we, we have all sorts of kind of things that we bring into our marriage that are our unrealistic expectations. And unfortunately, some of that is that we are just set up with these expectations around us and people, and it, for, it, it, it just brings us into a false sense of what God is going to, of what we, what we are looking for. So, for example, the whole dating process sets us up to have unrealistic expectations, yes? So, for exa example, maybe, um, uh, you know, you, when we start dating, what do we see? We see that he looks handsome, he's wearing a tie, or whatever he might be, he's on good behavior, uh, you know, she's dolled herself up, her hair is looking lovely. Uh, but then, of course, we get married, and then what happens is, is we wake up next to each other, and, of course, uh, her makeup's all over, if, if she's wearing any, and, um, and you've both got morning breath, and, uh, you, you know, there's all sorts of things, and suddenly that which was something that you fantasized about and dreamed about, you wake up and think, this is not what I expected. Yes? Is it just Kath that had <laughs> high expectations? <laughs> For example, in the dating process, you might find um, a guy say to you, would you like to go to the opera? What man in his right mind <laughs> would go to the opera? But when he's dating... He will even miss an England match <laughs> or a Borough match or whatever. You see, in the dating process, it's so unrealistic, isn't it? Because we do things that normally we would not do because we have, we have a different perspective. We've, instead of having mum goggles, we've got dating goggles. Yes, we're seeing things through rose-tinted glasses. Glasses. I mean, for example, the wedding itself sets you up, doesn't it? The bride, I just want to give you, to all you single guys, 
if you get married, you've got to understand the wedding day is about the bride and the bride's mother. Everybody else is supporting cast. They're just there for the bride and the bride's mother, okay? That's it. you just got to understand that. Don't, don't. But it is important for us. Now, for example, if you see, uh, you know, a, a girl is, is planning for a wedding. She plans it down to the, to the detail. You get these brides magazines. I mean, who looks like that? In the bride magazine, they, they, they doll them all up and they're all, you know, and it's kind of airbrushed out and everything looks lovely and that dress and everything looks so wonderful. And I want to tell you something else, guys. On your wedding day, that is the best she will ever look in her whole life. <laughs> it is all down <laughs> <laughs> she's dolled up, she's all make up on all the kind of flowing and all. Whoever walks around in a wedding dress at any other day? Nobody. So the dress itself, you know what I'm trying to say? No, you don't, anyway, okay. <laughs> Not enough guys in here, is it? That's <laughs> at least some did it. <laughs> it is, it is, guys, bait and switch. <laughs> because, and that's both ways. Because what happens is, is whatever it is that we we are doing up to the wedding. Then afterwards, we have certain expectations that we come with. And whatever those expectations, you bring them into the marriage. And if they're unrealistic expectations, you are setting yourself up to fail because of those expectations. It is important. Secondly, a thing that uh, sinks your marriage is unacceptable differences. We are different. And like I said, talked about the book at the beginning, opposites attract and then opposites attract. Opposites attract. We generally are attracted to someone who is different to ourselves. You look in most relationships, they are very different. It's like chalk and cheese. You don't think alike, you don't... I want to say to you that even if you think you have everything in common and you're kind of going through the dating process and I listen to people and they say, well, you know, we agree on this and we agree on that and whatever. I want to say to you, when you enter into marriage, you're going to understand there's a lot of differences for the simple reason she's a woman and you're a man. Or vice versa. You're a woman and he's a man. In other words... You think differently. You just do. You just have to know the fact that if you're a man, you think differently. That's what that Mother's Day thing with Goggles was. We do see things differently, profoundly differently. And so what actually attracts you can frustrate you afterwards. Because where, for example, you know, I, 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 when I met Kath, I saw somebody who was bubbly. Someone who was uh, loved being a party. She's a people's person. She was. She had all sorts of things that she could do. Yes. Now, obviously, because I was believing God to be a pastor, I wanted to make sure that she could do kids' work, play the piano. <laughs> so, you know, there's quite a good deal, guys. A good deal. Um, but there was also things. But once I'm married to her, then suddenly I think she takes nothing serious. She's always off. She's never in the house. You know what I'm trying to say? So what was a positive in the dating process in the marriage can become a frustration. Now, I know you never have that problem, do you? But that's what happens. We marry the opposite so often. You know, so in other words, someone who's very structured will often tend to find someone who is spontaneous. Someone who is reserved will often... Marry someone who is outgoing. And so the thing con continually goes. There's so many differences that we have. 
before we're married, we overestimate what we have in common. But when we're married, we underestimate what we have in common. Yes? Because we just see the difficulties so often. And so I believe it's important for us to look at our differences and to realize that although we are different, you know, you've heard the phrase, men are from and women are from. That's not right. They're different galaxies. (laughs) Completely different thinking. Every cell in our bodies is different. Our DNA is so different, the way that we are. And so we have got to accept our differences. We've got to start to appreciate our differences, to value our differences, to look at our differences and realize that the way that we are made is important so that rather than Kath trying to change me, my my daughter said to me, Patrick to me, she says, how long are you going to preach on marriage? I says, till Kath changes. (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be a long series, isn't it? No, okay, I'm joking. <laughs> We've got to value our differences. We've got to celebrate our differences, yes? I think that God's got a sense of humor. That's why he puts opposites together. Because he knows how we're going to tick together and we're going to be different. So, for example, early risers, they marry night owls, don't they? Yes? So in other words, somebody that's an early riser usually marries somebody that doesn't believe in God before 11 a.m. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? So we're, we're different. We, we know we're different. And yet that can so cause tensions and problems. Yes. People who are daring and impulsive usually marry people who are cautious and reserved. I like the illustration was when we eat, we eat with a knife and a fork. Not two knives, but two forks. And we are different, but we complement me together. We are meant to be together, yes? One of you loves to talk. The other likes to spend money. Sometimes they're in the same person. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you get somebody who loves to, cu- to cuddle and the other person's a porcupine. Do you know what I mean? We're so different, aren't we? You have one person that says, drop everything, and the other person says, drop dead. (laughs) We could go on and on about our differences. Oh, the the guy that said, I knew I was marrying Mrs. Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. (laughs) Happy Mother's Day, by the way. I believe that God uses marriage to help us grow. You are going to grow more in your marriage if you allow God to use you and to lose, use the differences and the things that you have that are different together. I believe God will bring more growth in your life than in any other situation because, you see, in marriage, you are closer to them than in any other relationship. You're going to see things that nobody else sees. Kath sees things about me that no one else ever sees. Yes, and so that's why you've got to value what, uh, what one another and know that it is going to help you to grow in him. Yes, I, bu- I believe it's important. I believe God uses marriage probably more than anything to grow your faith, to grow your character, to grow you to become more like him. If anything, I worry more about the relationships where they have everything in common, when they're so alike, because then there's nothing for them to rub each other up with. There's nothing for them to grow in, because if, if, I, if I say I, I like Chinese and Kath likes Chinese, there's no disagreement. If I like football and Kath likes football, there's no difficulties with the telly, is there? If there's... Do you know what I'm trying to say? In other words, if you're always agreeing about something, there's no room for growth. But it's in the differences that you learn to grow and you learn to develop and you learn to change and to be different in, in the way that you are. Yes? So in other words, differences in our relationship keep it varied, keep it interesting. Yes? I am never bored with Kath. Frustrated? Yes. 
but God knows. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Thank you. So in other words, it's important for us. The third thing that sinks a marriage is unro- unresolved issues. Unresolved issues. In other words, the things that you bring into your marriage, the baggage that you bring into your marriage, pre-marriage. Yes? In other words, you have been modeled marriage by your parents or by society or whatever your upbringing is, you bring things in. You bring your hurts, you bring your habits, you bring your hang-ups into your marriage. And when you bring those things into your marriage, then when somebody says something, so for example, if your spouse says something to you, it may not be anything to do what they've said, but it suddenly raises something in you of something that you have experienced in the past, and all of a sudden you bring it up and you bite you respond in anger. You, you kind of come with frustration. Why? Not because of what they've said, but because of what's going on inside of you. And every single one of us brings things, unresolved issues, into our marriage. That's why I say, if you're thinking of getting married, deal with the issue. Make sure that you're not bringing baggage into your marriage. Try to deal with some of the issues, whether it's childhood, you know, because you're going to have all sorts of things that come up. It might be how you raise your kids and how the, somebody talks to you or whatever it might be. There's so many issues, so you've got to understand you've got to deal with the unresolved issues that come into your life, yes? Because they will destroy your marriage. You know, so, and particularly uh, in, in the life that we, we live today, so many people have had so much um, baggage going on, so many things that that they've experienced that they come into the marriage that really just is ready to sink any marriage. And so you've got to deal with that, yes? In other words, your marriage, when you come in with your your problems, marriage doesn't create any problems, it just reveals them. So if you've already got difficulties, your marriage is not going to bring, bring problems, it is going to reveal them. It's going to show them up. You suddenly think, if you're, if you're selfish, if you're uh, full of yourself, then marriage is going to, to reveal that. Yeah? If you've got certain things that you don't like, so, for example, for some people that have been uh, with other partners in life and, uh, and those issues, then you come into marriage and you come in with maybe certain expectations of previous relationships, And that person doesn't understand what you are bringing into that relationship. And so you are bringing baggage that you shouldn't be bringing. They don't deserve your baggage. But so often we offload that and we expect them to be able to understand it and, and to deal with it. And it's our baggage. We need to deal with these unresolved issues in our life. Yes, more than anything else. It could be any number of things. Um, that could do that. Fourthly, the fourth thing that sinks a marriage is unforgiven hurt. Things that, 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 you know, in any marriage, the two of you are going to say things wrong, you're going to do things wrong, you're going to blow it because we are sinners. And so because of that, we need to have lots of, uh, you know, forgiveness in our marriage. We need to understand that. And so it's the un forgiven hurt that will cause a barrier, yes, in us. For the simple reason, when you get married, that person is the closest to you, knows you the best, but but they are the person that you love the most. And the person that you love the most is the one that can hurt you the most. So they can say things that can really hurt and really wound. And and, and if you don't deal with those uh, unresolved hurts, if you don't deal with them, they're going to fester like a wound and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's never going to get better unless you actually deal with them. If you just hold on to those hurts, uh, it will cause you a massive problem, yes? And we often, you know, we say, well, why do you not forgive? Well, sometimes why we don't forgive is for the simple reason we want to hold a card. So, for example, if, if Kath says to me, oh, you did this, then I got a card and I tell you, but you did. So it's like we, we have this pack of cards of, of things that we build up in our marriages because we are wanting to have some ammunition to fire back for when they pick out our faults, for where we have failed and when they hurt us. But holding on to a grudge will only destroy our marriages. Yes? 
Like, especially when we hold on to it, it really does poison us, yes? Now, you may be asking, well, maybe, Jonathan, you don't understand my marriage, you don't understand where I am, or maybe you're in, you've been through a situation like that. I want to say to you that there is always hope because we serve a God of hope. That's what he does. He brings hope. Romans 4 and verse 17, the top of your sheet says this, God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. God specializes in raising the dead. He raises, he's raised people physically, but he can raise it in your financially. He can raise it, he can raise the, whether it's dead marriage, he can bring it back to life. So wherever you are in a relationship, God can bring it back to life. He specializes in taking the old, the stagnant, and the stale and bringing it back round so that it's new, that it's fresh, that it's alive, that it's wonderful. God can do that. He specializes in it. So I want to quickly look at steps to marriage transformation, how you can bring marriage transformation. And the first thing is, is be responsible for your part. Take responsibility. Galatians 6 and verse 5 says each person must be responsible for himself. In other words, you're not responsible for your spouse's actions, your spouse's words and the spouse brings it, but you are responsible for what you say and for what you do and for what you think. And so that's important for us to do that is, is to realize that you can control your response. But we all the time we say she did this. He did that, and we use it as an excuse for doing it. We need to stop having pity parties. We need to stop complaining. We need to particularly stop comparing. How many times do we compare our spouse with somebody else's spouse, and we look at them and think, oh, you know, they've got a wonderful marriage. Things are going brilliant for them, yes? And so we look because we're only, again, seeing a snapshot of their marriage. We're not seeing what happens behind the door. We're not seeing what, what, what they're having to discuss. We don't see the work that they're doing. I want to say to you, if you see a good marriage, that didn't happen by chance. A good marriage happens because they work at it. They put the effort in. They put the time into it. They put the discipline in. They make sure that certain things happen. They protect their marriage. They have certain things. But if you think it is just going to happen, and time after time, this is what happens. People come and they get married, and then after the marriage, then they end up going to counseling. And they, they, they thought, or even before they go, um, if you read that book, um, with Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Got Married, uh, there he talks about some of the things, does Gary Chapman, about, about marriage and about the amount of people that he talks to. And, they, and he says to them, before I marry her, I want you to do, do some counseling. So he says, I always insist on doing counseling before a marriage. And he said to me, he says, because every one of them think, oh, but we're all right. We don't need counseling. Because we, we know one another. We're in love with one another. You know, we just get on with no issues. But that's free marriage once you get married and you're in the course of things, it's important to know and it's important to, to be wise about it. So we've got to do that. We've got to stop complaining. We've got to stop resenting. Stop blaming someone else. Stop blaming your spouse for your unhappiness. You are as happy as you choose to be. You are as close as God to God as you choose to be. You are as close to your spouse as you choose to be. Yes? You are as happy as you choose to be. So the issue is we've got to stop daydreaming, stop fantasizing about what might have been, and, and stop looking and thinking the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and realize it's actually greener where you water it. And that's important. Are you watering it? Yes. The other thing is this myth of incompatibility. The amount of times you'll say, oh, we're not compatible, we just don't get on, and we don't see eye to eye, and whatever, oh, no, well, that's just normal. Do you know what I mean? Well, let me just say to you that, uh, that there's no scientific basis for two people saying they're incompatible. Dr. Paul Turnier, the Swiss psychiatrist who wrote Understanding Each Other, said this, so-called incompatibility is a myth invented by judges in order to make a plea for divorce. It's like a common excuse for people to hide their failings. Misunderstandings and mistakes can be corrected if there is a willingness to do so. 
That's a leading psychiatrist. In other words, what he's saying is it's immaturity, it's stubbornness, it's selfishness that causes the problems, and if you deal with the root causes, it will transform your marriage. You can get on with each other. Or Dr. Paul uh, Popineau, Director of the Institute of Family Relationships, He's written dozens of books on marriages. And he says this, I don't believe in compatibility. I don't believe, uh, I, I, I don't believe in incompatibility. Sorry. I don't believe it exists. Almost any two people are compatible if they try to be. So it, 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 it's just nonsense for us to use that as an excuse. Now, let me just give you the key. And my time's run out, so I'll follow on next week. Matt, let me just give you a key to, to this. Is when you see issues in your marriage, is to tackle one problem at a time. Don't try to deal with all the issues. And I'll tell you what really works well is just try a little one. If you go for a little one and you get a win, then you do the next easiest one and you get another win and do the next easiest one and get another win. Instead, what we do, we look at the big things that we see and we try to tackle the big things and what happens is we just keep faltering and failing. But if you get some wins under your belt and realize actually we've got a win on this, we've arranged a date night finally, and then you get another win, or you, we'll do it regularly, we get another win. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That you get, we get a win on how we, how we uh, discipline our children. We get a win on whatever it might be that you can deal with the big issues uh, later on. Amen? So get some wins under your belt. Amen? And so my time has gone. So I'll finish with this. That, and, and, and unfortunately, I've only dealt with the things that cause problems to a certain extent. But do come at this and realize that if you will just look at your marriage from a different perspective and have faith and believe God for what he wants to do in your marriage, it will transform your marriage. Yes? And come next week because we'll do the, 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 the next uh, five uh, keys to transforming your marriage. Cons and and it doesn't just marry, it's not just about marriage, it's about relationships. It, it can apply to any relationship, whether it's a work colleague or whether it's your, your parents or whether it's your children or it's your neighbor, whatever, you know, if you, wherever there's, there's issues or if there's difficulties or there's conflicts, by putting these things into, into um, practice, it will transform your marriage. Amen? Hallelujah. So just put down on your communication card. I have one somewhere, I'm sure. Um, if you take your communication card and uh, just put your name on it and um, anything that you feel, if, you, if you're new here today, we'd love just to, uh, to catch up with you and uh, put whatever details you feel comfortable with. Um, um, but on, on the back of it, I'd love for you to today, maybe just on one of these things to say, what is it that maybe you brought into a relationship? If you're not married, just think of another relationship, uh, whatever that might be. A relationship that you want to see work, a, a relationship that you want to see advance. But particularly in marriage, if you've got something, is to look at that and say, what did I bring into my marriage? What were some of the issues that I brought in? Was it, was it unmet, um, uh, you know, s some unmet needs? Maybe it was some things that then, I, I, I had some hurts, I had some habits, I had some hang-ups. Maybe it was something that you brought in, you had some high expectations in your marriage and you realized that those expectations are what are really causing your marriage to go downhill and that you need to change those expectations and, uh, and, and to bring them and to say, God, maybe it's today is to say, Lord, I need to trust you, God, that I can, ch I can see a change, that, that you can change. Um, I don't know what it might be for you today, but I believe it's important for us maybe just to, to, to write that down and just to put some aspect of that into it. If there's something in your life that's unresolved, just put down that, deal with unresolved issue. Yeah? Maybe make a note of that on your paper. Think, I'm going to go home today and I'm going to deal with that. Because it might be something that your parents said, your parents did. It might be something you brought up at school and something somebody's bullied you or whatever it might be. It may be some, uh, you know, some previous relationship that you've had. And, and, and so you're now, you're very cautious and you're nervous about, about that. And so every time your spouse does something, it raises up that. And you think of that every time. 
And, and you've got to deal with that. And so just let me put that down, put deal with some unresolved issues. Because if you'll deal with those unresolved issues, it will benefit your marriage and your relationships profoundly. If you deal with some unresolved issues, it will change your relationships in your connect group and how you respond. Yeah, it's going to make a difference. So let's just do that. Let's stand, let's uh, pray, and uh, just put these in the, uh, in the, in the bucket uh, afterwards. And um, as, uh, as they, they come round, uh, we, would, uh, we would love that. Father, we just thank you that you are interested in every aspect of our life. We thank you, Lord, that you are interested in our marriages. We thank you, Lord, that, that you want to see transformation. And we today, Lord, say that if you believe, uh, Lord, that our marriage can be transformed, Lord, we're going to believe. Today, we're going to believe for transformation. Today, we're going to believe that, Lord, that what is can be different. It can be changed, and it will be changed. And we pray today, Lord, that you would help us to, Lord, to do the right thing. We pray that you would give us the power to do the right thing. We pray, Lord, that you would make us wise and help us, Lord, to do what, what needs to be done. That, Lord, that we would, Lord, live in harmony and live at peace and live, Lord, a loving relationship. I pray now, Lord, that there would, Lord, just be joy in every relationship. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that every single person that's in this church, Lord, would know joy in their relationships, in their small group relationships, in their marriage relationships, in their boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, in their parent relationships, uh, in, their, in their peer relationships. I pray right now that, Lord, that you would just bring a peace and bring a joy and bring, Lord, some things out. I pray, Lord, that you would help every one of us to see some little ways that we could, uh, that we could uh, Lord, improve our marriages. We pray, Lord, that you would just drop things into our heart, that, Lord, that it would, uh, that it would make a difference and we would, Lord, feel positive. I pray, Lord, today that hope would be born in every single person today because we thank you, Lord, that when we have hope, that, Lord, that everything changes. And so we ask for this in Jesus' lovely name. And all God's people.